Welcome back, party people. Mike here with The Social Life of Language, and today we are focusing on what some scholars are calling the gentrification of bilingual education programs. We'll be looking at an article titled Picturing Dual Language and Gentrification, an analysis of visual media and their connection to language policy. So we're looking at the way bilingual education programs are being presented or marketed, specifically looking at the photos, the pictures. Originally, bilingual education was the result of some very serious political action during the civil rights era. It was a decades long fight to get bilingual programs in schools, but it also wasn't just about language. It was a fight for quality education free from white supremacist values. In our present day, bilingual education programs, or what they're usually called now, dual language programs, have absolutely exploded in popularity. In today's video, we are thinking through the metaphor of gentrification, particularly the visual aspect of gentrification. Because when it comes to dual language education programs, there seems to be this observable pattern of using photos that feature, uh, how do I say this? It, they feature a lot of happy white babies. While the minoritized or racialized children are not exactly the center of attention anymore. So why is that? Let's find out. Okay, so before we get to the topic of dual language education programs, let's think about the metaphor we are using, the very complex term gentrification. For now, we might say that gentrification is the process where a privileged or dominant group of people move into an area and then slowly push out the minoritized groups of people. So often we see this dominant group of people with more power and influence coming in and remodeling and renovating and basically rehabilitating certain properties. And in order to attract the clientele with more money, they often spend a lot of time figuring out how to change the look of any particular property. So the visual marketing itself or producing a look of a neighborhood is one aspect of how a neighborhood might follow a gentrification trajectory. So the look is important because that look carries meanings with it. So an ugly house or an ugly store carries meanings. It might mean or look like poverty, for example. And that's probably not the clientele that we want to attract. Often the look of gentrifying businesses involve changing the actual language. So instead of a mom and pop restaurant that serves breakfast and lunch, we get bistros that serve brunch. Instead of liquor stores, you get wine shops. Instead of pawn shops, you get vintage or antique shops. So to be clear, the language is part of the look. So in this article, we are talking about the look of bilingual education programs, specifically photojournalistic pictures of dual language programs and then analyzing them as a multimodal set of signs. And by multimodal, we just kind of mean that we're thinking of signs or sets of signs that are attached to meaning that work together. For example, we might look at how words influence how we might interpret an image or a picture while also thinking about how images and pictures influence how we interpret words. So let's start with an example that will give us a running start into this article. To understand this gentrification context, we should think about the word bilingual because over time it became a highly politicized, highly stigmatized word. As I mentioned earlier, the struggle for bilingual education was part of the civil rights movement. Specifically, bilingual education was part of the struggle to change the overall curriculum of American education. This American education, for the most part, centered the experience of whiteness while stigmatizing racialized groups. Over time, the phrase bilingual education became attached to images of racialized populations and racialized political interest groups. Today, what scholars have noticed is that the word bilingual is more or less being stripped from education policy. For example, at the federal level, we started with the 1968 Bilingual Education Act and very slowly over a couple of decades, the B word was slowly mentioned less and less and less. And on a quick side note here, I once heard a professor say, just the 
way a picture is worth a thousand words, a word is worth a thousand pictures. Let me say that one more time. Just the way a picture is worth a thousand words, a word is worth a thousand pictures. Yeah. So the word bilingual became attached to images of immigrants, of poverty, of brown people, and in general, remedial education programs designed for children that were thought of as social problems. In other words, bilingual education over time has developed a look. So one of the first things we might want to be conscious of in this multimodal analysis of the gentrification of bilingual education programs is precisely the political move to take out the B word, to take out the word bilingual. So now we use phrases like dual language programs or two-way immersion or world language education. Doesn't that sound fancier? I mean, actually they don't. They're just words. But those words don't invoke the thousands and pictures of the very ugly racist history of American education. So in this sense, we can think of the removal of the word bilingual in favor of dual language education as one of the first steps to remodeling or renovating or rehabilitating or even just erasing the look and ideas that might come to mind when we think of bilingual education in American schools. Now remember, changing the word or two isn't going to do much. But when we combine words like dual language education and then start attaching them to pictures of white children, we need to start asking what this is going to do over time. Because pictures are not just passive things. Pictures are not just apolitical forms of documentation. Instead, let's think of pictures as playing an active role in creating perception. So pictures perform action in the world, and they help guide how we think about any particular something, which is one of the major points of this article. So in this sense, names like documentary photography or photojournalism is kind of deceptive because it implies that they're just showing the way something is. It's just a picture of what is going on. However, photos are really just showing a very partial reality from a certain point of view. So some of you know that I'm a photographer. And if I went in there to take pictures of a bilingual education program, I probably wouldn't have taken all of these photos with white children in front of the class because that would be my political choice as the photographer. I pick what I think is important. But to be clear, I'm not saying that the people who took these pictures were consciously taking pictures of white children or that they consciously consciously made a political choice, because at that point we're kind of just talking about the intentions of individual photographers. What I am saying though is that their pictures have political effects, whether they want them to or not. Because remember, pictures are not neutral or apolitical. Pictures always have the potential to be political despite the intentions of any individual photographer. Pictures help create a particular perception of what dual language programs are and who they are for. And very slowly over time, if you get hundreds or thousands of pictures that look a certain way, slowly words like dual language education can start to invoke particular images or dual language programs start to take on a look. In their research, our authors look at 35 images from 34 newspaper articles about local dual language programs. To analyze these photos, they're looking at which kids are positioned where in the photos, or who looks like the center of attention, or who looks like the active subjects, and also who is positioned as more passive subjects, or which children kind of just seem like they're part of the environment of the picture, as opposed to the center of the picture. The authors say that they want to show how visual images can reiterate gentrification messages and therefore merit inclusion in analyses that consider what shapes language policy as praxis. And to reiterate the point, in all these images that the authors looked at, they didn't find any images that were counter to the gentrification messages. For example, pictures of brown kids talking to their older brown relatives or parents. Because those kinds of pictures kind of sends a 
a message more related to heritage or language maintenance, which is also connected to older political perceptions of bilingual education. In this article, our authors use some pretty heavy theory about images. Quite a few big words in there, which I'm not going to go over here because I don't want to. Now, I also looked up some dual language marketing material. And in this video, I'm going to use some more practical photographer vocabulary words because they are way easier to understand. So let's look at a couple images I got from a Google search. And these are all from real schools from real dual language education programs. Okay, so up first we got so who is the center of attention in this photo? Who is the active child? And then which children are parts of the environment that kind of helps draw our eye to the active child? In photography, we have this thing called leading lines, which are elements of a photo that point to the main subject. For example, the reason a whole lot of people like taking pictures on train tracks is because train tracks are leading lines or lines that lead our eye directly to the main subject. Now, when I saw this picture, to me, to my eye, the arms of these kids raising their hand also work as leading lines that point to the active subject, that point to the main thing that's going on, which is a white child leading the class discussion. There we go, super easy, right? Now let's talk a little bit more about the role subjects can play in photos, especially when those subjects are part of the environment, like in this picture. We have a white child that is literally in the center of the photo, the most prioritized subject. And then we have non-white children on the sides, engaged in the same activity, but they're obviously deprioritized because they're kind of cut off. One of them, the arms are cut off. On the other side, we only have a brown arm in there. And then we have another non-white child in the background. So here the non-white children are regulated to supporting roles, almost like props, because they are part of the environment more so than they are the subject of the photo. And they are clearly not prioritized here. All right, there you go, another easy one. Okay, so let's look at one more photo and based off what we know, let's analyze this together. Let's see if we can figure out who is prioritized. How about this one? Mm. Okay, so now let's look at a couple pictures that the authors present in the article. Okay, so this is an interesting one because the arms of the white child are actually cut off, which might suggest that they're not the priority of the picture, but we gotta look at the direction the brown children are looking. That element tells us where we should be looking. All of a sudden, the white child becomes the center of attention. The white child is the active subject, while the brown children are kinda just looking on and playing supportive roles. Now remember, photojournalism is usually paired with text. And this particular picture was from a Chicago newspaper. And here we get a quote with someone affiliated with this school. And they say, Our English-speaking families have been waiting for this initiative for a long time. They are receiving dual language with open arms. Okay, so when we pair this photo with the text, we suddenly have a better idea of who this photo is for or who the intended audience is. Now, this is problematic on a lot of levels. Number one, it conflates whiteness with English speaking. Number two, it conflates the brown children with Spanish speaking. These are deeply ingrained racializing views about whiteness and non-whiteness, or here, the perception of Latinxes in the United States. So clearly the intended audience is white families who are English speaking. And in general, this is part of a larger pattern where white children learning two languages is often described as being gifted and talented, while racialized children learning two languages will often get labeled as an English language learner, or even worse, as limited English proficient. Okay, so our next photo is from Texas. Here we get a very similar vibe. We are looking at a white child performing some kind of action while a brown child passively looks on. And again, we gotta remember that photos are released into a political world. Here in the United States, we have a very healthy English only movement, which is rooted in anti-immigrant ideology. But what's complicated here is that in some cases, pictures like this could actually help protect a bilingual education program 
from being attacked politically. Because with pictures like these, we can always just say, look at the happy white babies who are learning. So these kinds of images are not just released into this political vacuum. And to me, these images are kind of like an all lives matter approach to bilingual education. Uh, the authors don't say that, that's just me talking shit. All right, so now on to the next picture. This is one from Nebraska, and according to the author's research, this program has more or less an equal number of white children and non-white children. I think for this photo, one of the important elements is that the teacher is white, and the child that's interacting with the teacher is identified by name underneath this photo. And to me, I read it as a white sounding name. And the brown child that we might have been able to see, well, his face is just blatantly cut off. Now, when I look at this picture, the whiteness of the teacher has the potential to signal to white parents that this particular bilingual space is safe for white children. The authors tell us that this city where the school is located has actually had a lot of negative press relating to racism. So in this case, we might actually wonder if centering whiteness was intentional in this newspaper. Okay, so what kind of conclusions can we draw from these kinds of pictures? Well, that's actually what's so complicated because alone, single images don't really have much power to change the world or to change the perception of bilingual education at large. But when we put these images in the context of a gentrifying school or neighborhood, we can think of these pictures as playing an active role in how the look of bilingual education is being changed to attract a very specific middle class, English speaking, and probably white clientele. And I'm intentionally using the word clientele to signal that many of these white parents are uncritically thinking of the advantages that their own children might gain, which in many cases completely deprioritizes the anti-racist and social justice oriented motivations of what bilingual education could be and what it was meant to be from the beginning. Instead, what we're starting to see is the exclusion of non-white parents from the decisions that influence policy writing, which means that bilingual education, intentionally or not, and in many different ways, is starting to become a way for middle-class, English-speaking white students to boost their resumes for their college applications. So if we take a step back and think of our original gentrification metaphor, where you see a socially dominant group of people move in, see something valuable, begin to market that to other people that are in similar social positions, which then has the effect of taking over this space that was traditionally for a marginalized group of people. And then finally, we see that dominant group succeeds in extracting the value all for themselves. That whole gentrification process kind of appears to be a really good metaphor to describe the gentrification of dual language education. And now these these pictures aren't going to cause all of that to happen, but they are an important element to this process we call gentrification. So like our authors are suggesting, we should definitely be paying attention to the way these pictures are being used and what they can do over time. Well, that's all for today, folks. Don't forget, you can find all of my publications on maestromikemena.com or on academia.edu. And don't forget, you can support this channel directly through Patreon. This is Mike with The Social Life of Language. And we're done.